Hello, uh, we're going to cover chapter two in this video lecture. It's theories of development. So, first of all, let's look at what the word development is about. Studying development is focusing on the trends and patterns of change. And by understanding when we change, how we change, why we change, we have a better understanding of how we all develop as humans. To better understand the development, early psychologists began to develop theories. And when you put out a theory in a peer-reviewed journal, it is available for other people to comment. The goal of these theories is to provide a framework for the study of human development. That gives us an opportunity to have an organized way of studying lifespan psychology. So, First thing when it comes to development, we have to understand the difference between continuity and discontinuity. Continuity is developmental changes that appear as the result of a slow but steady progression. So you're born somewhere around 9, 10, 11 months. You start to pull yourself up with the coffee table, the crib, wherever you happen to be sitting. By the time you're 12 months old, you can manage to get yourself up. Between 12 and 14 months, you start to walk. And all of these things are slow changes that occur at a fairly regular schedule. Discontinuity are developmental changes that occur as a result of an abrupt change. So the biggest discontinuity for most children is the death of a parent or a sibling. And in this particular scenario, it could radically change the development of a kid. So for example, let's say that someone who is three or four years old, who is you know, beginning to communicate, loses an older sibling who's five or six. Well, that may result, and again, may result, doesn't always, in a scenario where that three or four year old is reluctant to communicate because there was this con discontinuity trauma just as they were beginning to communicate in a rational way. Both of these influence development in a combination of direct and indirect effects. We're going to look at Sigmund Freud first. Um, his theory was a psychoanalytic theory. And according to Freud, the structures of the mind are empowered by what we call the libido. And this is the psychic energy that drives men and women. This psychic energy is similar to what we see as a physical energy that fuels our body functions, but it is more focused on the mind. Um, today, we often use the word libido in terms of our sex drive, but for Freud, it was more about that cognitive energy that is fueling our ability to think. According to Freud, the structures of the mind are broken into three components. First, we have the id, and this structure is, begin is present when we're born. It contains all our basic instincts. And think about a baby who's very, very young. They're hungry, they want to be dry, and they want to be cared for. Um, this idea of our basic instinct is that these basic needs will give us pleasure. It helps secure pleasure. So if we're hungry and someone feeds us, it makes us feel good. If we're wet and somebody dries us off, it makes us feel better. If we are in clothes that have been messed, putting on clean clothes makes us feel better. And of course, when somebody hugs us or holds us, that too makes us feel better. The ego, which is the usually rational part of our personality, um, this begins to develop after we're born. And this is what is all about our planning and keeping us in touch with reality. The stronger the ego becomes, the more successful the person becomes, according to Freud. Last, we have our superego, and this is our conscience. It dictates what is right and what is wrong. And this develops during our infancy, when we learn the difference between getting a cookie because our mom is handing us one and getting a cookie because we punched our brother and stole his cookie. 
So if you want to think about it in the sense of how I have it listed here, your super ego is the angel on your shoulder, your id is the devil on your shoulder, and your ego is the planning part. Your ego doesn't tell you if something is right or wrong, it just tells you this is how you can plan. So let me give you some examples here. There is a never-ending battle between the id and the superego, and the ego is kind of in the middle looking for the fastest solution. So here's some examples. You have no money. You broke. You have no money. Your id wants money. Your ego, planning, I can rob a bank. Your superego, that's the angel saying, you're crazy, you're going to go to jail. So the ego doesn't necessarily judge whether an action is right or wrong. It just comes up with a fast planning and organizing scenario. It's this super ego that tells you if you're going to do the right thing or the wrong thing. Another scenario being hungry. Your id, I'm hungry. The ego looks in the kitchen, sees a donut. I'll eat a donut. The super ego, no, no, you're going to get fat. You should eat carrot sticks. So again, what we're looking at here is the super ego is that angel telling us what we should be doing as opposed to the devil, which is, you know, just looking for food. It doesn't care what the food is. So let's look at personality stages according to Freud. Now, he believes that our personalities are fixed by the time we are 18. And as such, he has divided up from 0 to 18 into five stages. The first stage is the oral stage. And this occurs from birth to 18 months. At this time period, the mouth is the pleasure center. The function is to gain the appropriate amount of sucking, eating, biting and talking. In other words, they explore the world through their mouth. If you ever hand a baby something, inevitably the first thing they try to do is put it in their mouth. It is the way they explore. You know, especially when they're young, under 12 months, they don't walk, they're just, you know, towards the end of 12 months beginning to master crawling. So for them, the world is what is in their hand and what they can do with it, which is put it in their mouth. This is why babies love to put their feet in their mouth, their fingers in their mouth, anything they can get into their mouth. Now, as adults, what Freud would say is if we got stuck at this point where our mouth still gives us the greatest pleasure, this is where, as an adult, we have an oral fixation. So smoking, thumb sucking, biting our nails, overeating when stressed, chewing gum constantly is a way to comfort ourselves. It's a way to make us feel better. It gives us pleasure. So when you see somebody who's smoking, it's not necessarily because they, ne they love the taste of nicotine or cigarettes. It's that it makes them feel better. Next stage is what we call the anal stage. And this is from age one and a half or 18 months to three years old. The anus is the pleasure center because this is the time period where you are toilet training and it becomes the focus of a reward or a punishment. So if a child uses the potty successfully, oftentimes he or she may get a reward. They may get a cookie, they could get M&Ms, they might get special underwear, um, they get to use daddy's phone. So there's all kinds of rewards for successful potty training. And then if a child is not successful, they're oftentimes punished. They have to go back into diapers, they're not allowed to sleep in a regular bed, they have to have different, um, you know, they might get spanked, you know, there's all kinds of consequences to a child who is not potty training successfully. And what happens is that as an adult, that stressed out potty training can have some pretty negative aspects on a person's personality. And this again, all according to Freud, and a lot of these aspects are still followed to this day. So on the one hand, you have somebody who is anal retentive, and this means having an overwhelming need to control their environment being excessively stubborn and being very organized. 
So for example, you know, and this is something that I do and I'm very anal retentive. I go into Walmart, I see those cheap DVDs at the front of the store that they're all thrown in there and I am there totally organizing them. Um, other people, and here you'll see this little uh, comic over here, Anal Retentives Anonymous tonight, and he is measuring to make sure that each of the chairs is equidistant from the center. People like this need to control their environment because that feeling of being out of control makes them feel very anxious. Now on the other side of the coin, so to speak, is anal expulsive. These people tend to be very disorganized, very messy, very emotional, oftentimes can be cruel and rebellious. And in this kind of a context, it's someone who feels better when they're surrounded by chaos. So if your bedroom looks something like this, you know, you have to ask yourself, how was my potty training? And if your mom and dad are still around, you might want to ask them how things went. Were you an easy kid to potty train or were you more of a challenge? The third stage of Freud's personalities um, evolution is the phallic stage. This runs from ages three to five, and the purpose is to develop a healthy interest in sexuality towards the opposite gender. Now, I am not saying that a three-year-old has sexual feelings. However, what Freud is saying is that this is the time period where the children begin to notice the differences between genders, especially genitalia. Around ages four and five, this is when kids start to experiment. They play doctor. I'll show you mine if you show me yours. And again, they're not really looking at it from a sexual point of view as much as a, wow, you're totally different than me. And this can often translate to an adult person in terms of finding their opposite gender parent fascinating and may reject his or her same gender parent. So, for example, little girls are often fascinated by watching their daddy shave in the morning, watching the beard and mustache get shaved off. Um, it's not something they see mom do, whereas little boys may become very fixated on watching mom put on her pantyhose and put her lipstick on and, you know, become fascinated at what she does to make herself pretty. Now, at some point, when a young man becomes obsessed with an older woman or a young woman becomes obsessed with an older man romantically, we get into um, some abnormal behavior. Now, at the abnormal level, a father-son um, dynamic is called the, or I'm sorry, father-daughter dynamic is called the electric complex and the mother-son dynamic is called the Oedipal complex. Now, to explain this in more detail, I have a couple celebrity couples here for you to uh, <clears throat> look at. An Oedipus complex is when a man is attracted to women closer to his mother's age than his age. And what Freud believed is that they still seek their mom's attention and approval. So they seek approval from women who remind them of their mother. So for example, and this is a very famous couple that broke up a few years ago, Ashton Kutcher was married to Demi Moore and she was 16 years older than he is. And of course they divorced and now he's dating someone his own age. However, it is very rare to see a woman in her 40s dating a man in his 20s. On the other side of the coin, it is much more common for a younger woman to be interested in an older man. Now, a lot of times it has nothing to do with having a daddy fixation. Rather, what they want is financial stability. They want a more mature person. But a lot of times when we get into the abnormal aspect, the electric complex, these women are seeking approval and affection from a daddy substitute. So you have somebody like Mary Kate Olson who is rich, 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 got money out the wazoo, and yet she's dating a man who is 17 years older than her, Olivier Sarkozy, who is actually the son of the former French president. And, you know, clearly he's not stunningly handsome. He's not particularly um, talented. He is just 
many years older than her. But for some reason, he is clearly providing her with the approval and attention that she may not have gotten from her own father. In the fourth stage, we go into what's called the latency stage. And this is from ages 5 to 12. And this is when the focus is on same gender relationships. Children treat the opposite gender playmates with disdain. Um, I personally call it the cootie stage because that's when the eight-year-old finds, you know, the eight-year-old boy thinks all girls have cooties and don't want to kiss them, which obviously changes significantly when they're 14 or 15. Um, sex sexual interest is mostly dormant, but it begins to emerge as the child approaches puberty. And children tend to play with their same gender until around age 10. And then they start to kind of mix and blend a little bit. The last stage is called the genital stage. And this is usually ages 12 to 18. Um, biologically, there's a surge of hormones that bring about the return of the phallic stage, the fascination with the opposite gender. But teenagers have the conscious realization that being attracted to your mom or dad is just wrong. It's taboo. So the fixation is no longer on mom and dad, but on their peer groups, people who are their own age and who are opposite genders. The next person we're going to look at is Eric Erickson. And he is going to provide the framework which we will use through the rest of this class. And one of the reasons that I use Erickson is because he doesn't just look at childhood. He looks at all aspects of a person's life, from being born to end of life. And as such, he really does reflect the issues that occur throughout a person's life. He divided up the human life into a series of eight stages. And each of these stages is marked by a crisis that needs to be resolved so that individual can move forward. If they don't resolve the crisis, they oftentimes get stuck or they're unable to develop a certain skill set that would benefit them later on. Now, this is the um, basic idea of what he's talking about. And we are going to go over this many, many times as we go through each of these stages. So when you're thinking about the quiz, you should know the general concepts, but in terms of the actual specifics, I won't be quizzing you until we get to the actual stage of development that we're studying. So from birth to 18 months old, we call this infancy, the big crisis is can you learn to trust or mistrust? Now if you learn to trust, you develop hope. And the main influence at this stage is your mom, mostly because and still in this country, the mom is the one who stays home or is the primary caregiver to babies. Then we jump to ages two to three. We call this early childhood. At this stage, this is when the potty training is all going on. So the crisis is autonomy, which is independence versus shame or doubt. What you develop is willpower. And at this time, both parents or adult substitutes, because a lot of times it's grandma or grandpa or the daycare or babysitter who's working with the child, are the main um, influences. Ages four and five, which is what we call preschool age. Um, this is the time period where kids learn to take initiative. This is the crisis. Initiative versus guilt. What we're looking for is, will a child attempt to do something on their own or will they feel like they've done something wrong and stay very insulated and not try to explore? What skill they learn if they, in fact, achieve the over overcome the crisis of in initiative versus guilt is the sense of purpose, knowing that they can accomplish something. And at this point, you know, we're starting to look at a wider circle of people in their lives. They may have play dates. They may have friends from the neighborhood, 
of course their parents, family, siblings. Age 6 to 11 is middle childhood and their crisis is industry versus inferiority. And this is the ability to get something done versus feeling like you're useless. And what do you learn? What strength do you develop? Competence. So if you are taking dance lessons, if you're taking karate, if you're doing well in school, you know, if you're playing Pop Warner football, it doesn't matter. But if you feel successful, if you feel like you know what you're doing, you develop a sense of competence. And that is one of the most important things for young children to develop is a sense that I can do this. I can make this happen. And we're beginning to see the shift away from mom and dad towards the school and the friends and the teachers being the primary influence in the child's life. Then we jump to adolescence, ages 12 to 18, the dreaded teen years. And the crisis is identity versus identity confusion. And at this stage, this is when people figure out or want to try to figure out who they are. So your cute little daughter who likes pink may suddenly decide she's goth, dyes her hair black, puts on black makeup, wears only black clothes, and this may go on for a year, and then she's back to regular clothes. Other children may fix their identity at a very young age. So for example, somebody who played Pop Warner football and then they get to junior high and they start playing football in junior high and then they get to high school and now they're playing varsity football, their entire identity might be wrapped up with the idea that they are the big football player on campus. Some children experience identity confusion. They don't know who they are. One week they're taking dance lessons, the next week they want to play hockey, the following week they don't want to do anything. So, you know, this is a time period where kids get really confused about who they are. The strength that they learn at this point is fidelity, loyalty, understanding. Because what we're really doing when we identify our identity is figuring out who our tribe is. So, for example, in high school, I got involved in the theater department, and I really felt part of that particular tribe, and they were very loyal, and I was very loyal to them. And to this day, I am friends with m many of my um, high school peers who were in the theater department. So we have maintained a sense of loyalty. And of course, at this age, our primary influence are our peers, are the people who we would consider our friends in the same age group. 18 to 35, we call this young adulthood, and this is where we are supposed to be finding our life partner, finding intimacy, developing lifelong friendships. Now, the crisis, intimacy versus isolation, if a person doesn't feel like they can open themselves up to someone else, they become isolated, i.e. the lone wolf. Um, if they develop a good sense of intimacy, the strength that they develop is love. And their primary influences are their spouse, friends, their partner. Those are the people that begin to influence them the most. Then we get to middle age, which is ages 35 to 65. The crisis is generativity, which means still being active versus stagnation, which is basically sitting on the couch and watching TV. 23 hours a day. If we overcome the crisis of generativity, we develop a strength called caring. We are not just sitting there being mindless slugs. We care about the people around us. And our family and society as a whole is something that we want to make better. The last stage is old age, and this is anyone over 65. The crisis is integrity versus despair. Integrity meaning you feel like you lived a good life and you learned a lot and you experienced a lot. Despair meaning you have a lot of regrets. If you've lived a life that is filled with integrity, you've got lots of wisdom. And our main influence at this time are all humans. You know, now we're nearing our death and we want to make sure we've left the earth a better place than when we got there. 
These are some more information about Ericsson. So I'm just going to very quickly run through this um, because I know I spent a lot of time on the chart. Infancy, children learn cause and effect. When they learn cause and effect and the mother or father is there, so when the baby cries, they get picked up. What they develop is trust and this flourishes with warmth and care and consistency. The world has to be orderly and predictable so infants can learn cause and effect. If mom is a crack addict or, you know, dad is violent and things are never ever calm, that baby is going to live in a world of chaos and their emotional barometer is going to be chaotic. Early childhood, we acquire self-control and the feeling of accomplishment, usually through potty training. In preschool, the child must learn how to manipulate their environment. And if the parents or siblings make the, the child feel incompetent, the child develops generalized guilt. They feel like they've done something wrong, that they're not good enough. And this is something that carries through all the way to adulthood. There are lots of people out there who, when they make a mistake and they're made to feel bad, they really beat themselves up because they feel guilty about letting other people down. And for kids, you know, play is the way they deal with this issue. Play is so important to children, and that's why with child counseling, a lot of it involves playing with the child because that's how they manifest or, or display their emotions. Then we get into middle childhood where again play is very important but it becomes task oriented. You're going to play baseball, you got to learn the rules. You're going to play cards, you got to learn the rules. You understand what winning and losing is about. Um, accomplishments at this stage should be emphasized so the child will feel good about themselves and not feel inferior. Adolescence, again the sense of identity being the primary goal. The teenager strives towards achieving the identity they see for themselves. And that's why role models are so very important in the world because most of us see someone we admire and we identify that person by their characteristics and we try and take on those characteristics. Young adulthood, ages 19 to 34, 18 to 35, and this is the ability to open oneself to another person and in turn accept another person's hopes and fears. In other words, most of us are going to get married. About 95% of people in the United States eventually get married. And unfortunately, the divorce rate is about 50%. So, you know, there's a lot of issues about marriage and we're going to go into that in much more detail when we cover young adulthood. Middle adulthood, the goal is to stay productive and creative, which leads to a personal sense of fulfillment. And we also want to make society a better place for all of us. Then we get into old age, the feeling that the person has had a well-spent life, the feeling they've gained wisdom. And, you know, really what it boils down to is, do you have regrets or are you happy with the choices you've made? I mean, we all have one or two regrets. You shouldn't have gotten in the car when you were drunk. You shouldn't have dropped the class. You shouldn't have cheated on your girlfriend or boyfriend. But, you know, in the long run, most of us looking at our lives should be fairly happy with the vast majority of the decisions we've made. We're also going to look at B.F. Skinner. He is um, a psychologist who developed the theory of operant conditioning and what that means is adding a stimulus or taking a stimulus away in order to achieve a particular behavior. So he demonstrated that the environment has a much greater influence on learning and behaviors than previously realized. The environment, i.e. parents, teachers, and peers, react to our behavior in either a positive way or a negative way. And these how they react to us tells us if we're doing a good thing or a bad thing. So positive reinforcement will make us repeat the behavior and negative reinforcement will make us eliminate the behavior. And I have a chart on the next slide that goes into this with more detail. So positive reinforcement is any action that makes the response more likely to happen in the future. And if you look down here, positive reinforcement, every time you make your bed, you get money. 
and that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of us are just motivated by money. Um, negative reinforcement. A negative reinforcement, our negative consequences are removed because of the action. So looking down here at the example, negative reinforcement, you are making your bed, so mom stops nagging you. So if, you know, your mom is on your butt every morning, why don't you make your bed? Why don't you make your bed? And you make your bed, she's not going to nag you about it. She'll probably nag you about something else, but the point is negative reinforcement is also kind of a good thing because you're getting rid of those negative consequences. It's like a speeding ticket. You know, if you're speeding and you get a ticket, the next time you're going to slow down. That's the idea. And then you won't get a ticket. Then we have what Skinner called positive punishment. And this is adding a stimulus to prevent a future event. So in terms of the example, you know, if you hit your sister, you get spanked. Or if you mess up in school, you get detention. So you're adding a punishment. Now, a negative punishment is removing a stimulus, removing something to prevent future event. So, you know, my example on the chart is you hit your sister, you lose TV privileges. So you're not getting spanked, but you're losing something. Um, another example is when siblings fight over an iPad. They both lose the iPad privileges. So what you're saying is if you do this, this punishment is coming in and it's not a fun punishment at all. So that covers the theories that we're going to be covering for this week. We are going to be looking at other theorists, but um, I don't want to overwhelm you with too many theories because there's a lot out there. And um, these are some of the more important ones to know at the very beginning of this class. If you have any questions, please feel free to text me or email me. And also, we'll be having a quiz for the next class session, and this PowerPoint will definitely be on it. Thank you.